well, we're headed to a civil war. Good morning. <laughs> I hope that woke you up. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but but this is what you're hearing in the news, in podcast articles. Uh, this is being mentioned. It's being uh, you know confirmed by polls that show that uh, the majority of the population, more than half of the American population, believe, believes that in the next few years there will be a civil war. And so there's talk that the country is hopelessly divided, that the U.S. is more polarized than it's ever been. And it's confirmed by other polls that show that 90% uh, of Americans say they see strong or very strong conflicts between supporters of different political parties uh, compared to an average of 50% in other wealthy industrialized countries around the world. Biden himself uh, gave a speech last month where he said that too much of what is happening today in our country is not normal and then went on to uh, warn Americans of the threat to democracy coming from MAGA Republicans. And of course, the response from the Republicans didn't uh, really wait, especially on Twitter. All kinds of tweets came out from uh, Ronna McDaniel, for instance, the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee, said that uh, Joe Biden is the divider in chief and the Democratic Party is a party of divisiveness, disgust and hostility toward half the country. Rick Scott, the uh, Republican Senate campaign chief, tweeted that, I hear this raving lunatic attacked half the country tonight because they don't agree with his uh, liberal agenda. So I think this paints a very clear picture of a society that's split into two camps, you know, along party lines, uh, on cultural issues, on, on issues of, you know, American identity and American values and stuff like that. A recent article in the LA Times said that perhaps the most unrealistic of Biden's campaign promises we would say probably all of them were pretty unrealistic, uh, but the most unrealistic one was his repeated suggestion that he could bridge the deep gulfs that divide American society. The U.S. is more split than ever. So what is that division? What is this uh, supposed culture war? The term culture war originates uh, way back in, uh, you know, Bismarck's Kulturkampf uh, in, in 19th century Germany and, you know, basically in, in, in his uh, taming and attacks against the, the influence of the Catholic Church in the state. Uh, but the modern usage uh, of that word to refer to, uh, to the U.S. and U.S. politics was coined by a sociologist of the name of uh, James Davison Hunter uh, in a book, in a 1991 book titled Culture War is the Struggle to Define America. And this is very much in line with Biden's uh, grand claim in his speech last month uh, that th this upcoming midterm election is a battle for the soul of this nation. Uh, and so culture war then is defined as a conflict between social groups and the struggle for dominance of their values, beliefs, and practices. And so in the context of the U.S., this is framed as a clash between old, conservative, uh, traditionalist values and then like, you know, young, progressive, or, or liberals. And of course, this view totally, um, you know, uh, sidelines or skips any class uh, content in society, which is Marxist, we would argue, that is the main uh, dividing line under capitalism, is, is class division. And precisely as we, as we talked about yesterday, at a time when uh, class consciousness is higher than it's been in recent memory in the US, uh, at a time when uh, class polarization is growing, right, there's a huge increase in the, uh, in the wealth gap, especially since 2020 during the pandemic, the rate of exploitation is growing, inflation is eroding the living standards of workers. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, the, uh, the, the number of people that identify as middle class uh, has decreased in favor of workers identifying as working class. Uh, and as we also explained yesterday, uh, the largest share of the workforce are millennials and Gen Z, who are also the layer of the population that identifies the most as working class. So again, culture war sort of skips over this and frames everything from the point of view of, uh, of a cultural clash along many different fronts. And the fronts are, I mean, there's, there's a million and one fronts of this culture war that you could say. Of course, the question of abortion rights uh, is a huge issue. Uh, also LGBTQ rights and trans rights in particular. The question of racism, is America racist? You know, what is the, uh, histo the real history uh, of racism in this country? The question of voting rights uh, is also related to that, right? And, and the racist gerrymandering that's, that's being carried out. Uh, the question of what can be taught in schools and what, what can't. Political correctness, uh, cancel culture, xenophobia, immigration. You see the disgusting theater of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Republican politicians in, in Texas and so forth filling up planes with immigrants to send them up to, uh, to the Northeast to 
make a statement and, and you know, make uh, basically uh, in, in this racist demagogy. Uh, the question of gun violence uh, and the right to uh, to to uh, own own a weapon, uh, also this question of the cultural divide between the rural population and uh, the urban population, right? The college-educated cultural elites versus the the uh, the white working class, blue-collar workers, uh, climate change, right, and the the clean energy transition um, versus coal burning, you know, uh, polluting pickup trucks and stuff like that. Uh, and of course, the pandemic, uh, this question of, uh, you know, of mask mandates, uh, vaccination skepticism that has emerged over the last period. And the list could, could go on and on and on. It's, this is not comprehensive, really can be almost uh, anything. It's, uh, the culture war is based on these wedge issues uh, that are propped up by either of the two capitalist parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, that are framed from the point of view, precisely, of these supposedly irreconcilable cultural values and of the identity of different groups of the population. Now, of course, it's not just talk. It's not just tweets. Uh, there's all kinds of laws uh, and that are being passed uh, or at least introduced in state after, after state. Over the uh, past three academic years, legislators in 45 states proposed 283 laws to restrict what teachers can say about racism and American history in the classroom, what they can say about sexuality, about LGBTQ issues, to limit the rights of trans transgender students, uh, to limit access to books and, and libraries, and explicitly to promote uh, patriotic education, whatever that, that may be. And of course, um, you know, uh, in terms of the discussion of the book banning, it's getting pretty ridiculous. Over the last, uh, sorry, over three months last year, 330 books were censored because they talk about different issues of race and LGBTQ uh, people. Uh, some of the most famous bills that the comrades may have heard of, uh, things like the Don't Say Gay bill in Florida. By the way, the real name of the bill, if you didn't know about it, is the Stop the Sexualization of Children Act, which sounds even more ridiculous. And there's an, another dozen states that are trying to introduce uh, bills uh, along those same lines. And again, these things can get really, really absurd. There's an assistant principal uh, in, in a Mississippi elementary school who got fired uh, earlier this year for reading a picture book to uh, second graders. The book was titled, I Need a New Butt, and it jokingly describes the adventures of a child who searches for a new posterior. Uh, and I guess that, I guess it just went too far in the sexualization of, ch of children or something like that. But uh, this teacher, uh, this, this uh, principal lost, lost their job. Um, but uh, more seriously, um, this, this flurry of reactionary laws represents an onslaught uh, against all kinds of civil and democratic rights that were won through mass struggle over the past uh, you know, decades, from reproductive rights to voting rights, students' right to learn about oppression and LGBTQ issues, to trans people's rights to even exist. Uh, this is undermining you know, all, all of these uh, things that, that the working class was able to win through struggle. Uh, in 2018, just to give an example for comparison, 40 anti-LGBTQ laws were proposed around the country. That's bad enough. But in just three months this year, from January to March, legislators proposed 240 anti-LGBTQ laws restricting healthcare for trans youth, excluding trans youth from athletics, uh, restricting the rights of trans students at school, limiting the use of, of bathrooms. Uh, and this is very uh, dire consequences. In, in 2021, last year, was the deadliest year on record for transgender and gender nonconforming people in the US. Three quarters, the vast majority of LGBTQ youth reported that they had experienced uh, you know, uh, discrimination based on their uh, sexual orientation or, or gender identity. Half of transgender and non-binary youth seriously considered suicide last year. And of that, 20%, um, uh, one in five actually attempted suicide. So, I mean, this is uh, horrible uh, conditions. In fact, the suicide rate among trans teens is six times higher than among uh, teenagers in general. Now, of course, the repeal of Roe v. Wade in particular is a very dramatic uh, turning point uh, for the US. Just like that, tens of millions of people in half of the states across the country have lost or will very likely lose their fundamental right over their bodies and the, the, the fundamental right to abortion. 13 states already have passed full bans. Another five states have partial bans based on, you know, uh, you know after, after six months, uh, sorry, after six weeks, 
when most women wouldn't even know they're pregnant, for instance, abortions are banned in some of them. Another 10 states, bans were proposed, but they're being battled in the courts. Uh, they've been temporarily blocked. Uh, but of course, we know that banning abortion doesn't mean that women won't get an abortion. It just means that in many cases, they'll have to do it uh, in, in unsafe ways, through illegal channels, that they have to spend a lot more money to try to travel out of state. Um, and they're going to be ostracized. They're going to be punished uh, for, for, for this, uh, which is uh, really, uh, it's like unheard of in the 21st century in the wealthiest country on earth that these are the conditions that millions of people are going to be facing. So oppression is uh, rampant. It has very real material implications for millions of people, and it will only increase on the basis of this uh, right-wing onslaught. And I think this raises a whole series of questions. I think, first of all, why is this happening now, right? Why in the 21st century, for example, the wealthiest country on earth cannot guarantee the right to abortion to its population? Why is this right-wing frenzy being propped up? Uh, and is there a way to end it? Uh, is there a way to cut across this reactionary polarization in society? And I think most importantly, how can we successfully fight against these attacks? And how can we ultimately end oppression and all forms of, of discrimination uh, forever? And I'm uh, going to try to answer some of these questions in my lead off. Um, but the liberals are absolutely hopeless uh, in, in being able to understand this phenomenon. Uh, they're totally impotent. Earlier this year, the New York Times published an opinion piece titled, America is falling apart at the seams. And it includes quotes uh, like, like the following. Americans' hostility toward one another seems to be growing. Society is dissolving from the bottom up as much as from the top down. There's an increase in all kinds of bad behavior, hostility, recklessness, as well as a rise in polarization, hatred, anger, and fear. So the author's conclusion to that was, what the hell is going on? The short answer, I don't know. Um, as a columnist, I'm supposed to have some answers, but I just don't right now. I just know the situation is dire. Now, he admits he doesn't know what's going on, but he, could, he couldn't just shut up, so he kind of keeps, keeps going in his article. And, uh, and he says that we can round up the usual suspects, social media, rotten politics, and Donald Trump. Uh, but then also he continues, some of our poisons must be sociological, and some of the poisons must be cultural but there must also be some spiritual or moral problem at the core of this. So in other words, there's a culture war due to cultural poisons, society is divided due to sociological poisons, and the moral disintegration of America is due to moral problems. This explains <laughs> absolutely nothing. And like with the culture war, this, uh, this New York Times author sees ideas, morality, values in the abstract as the driving force in history and society. But like we explained uh, yesterday, that is a philosophically idealist view of the world. And as Marxists, we are materialists, right? We understand that ideas in the abstract are not the primary driving force in history. Marxism explains that in the final an analysis, it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, direct mechanical relation, but that ultimately consciousness is determined by material conditions. So of course, we agree that Trump, with his inflammatory, ridiculous rhetoric uh, and actions, uh, is only further contributing to the polarization and chaos in society. It's also true that the internet uh, you know, uh, ex gives exposure to certain ideas that people would otherwise maybe not come across, that the algorithms create some sort of echo chamber. All of that is true, but for an idea to actually land, to actually take root in society, to actually convince someone that, it's, that it might be true or possible, it must have some kind of basis in their experience. Uh, and so what is that experience? We also uh, you know, had a full session yesterday about this. For decades, the living standards of the US working class have declined by pretty much every single measure. I'm not gonna repeat yeah, you know, the, the whole economic stats that we discussed yesterday, but just uh, briefly, wages have stagnated since the 70s and now with inflation, it's only getting worse. Life expectancy has fallen by two years, but even before the pandemic, life expect expectancy fell uh, every year uh, for three years in a row. 112 million people struggle to pay for healthcare. Half of the American workforce doesn't earn enough to rent a one-bedroom apartment. 
and well-paid manufacturing jobs have declined for 40 years, and especially between 2000 and 2010, one third of manufacturing jobs were eliminated, and that destroyed the livelihood of six million workers. So that is what the status quo represents for millions of Americans. And the Democrats in particular, they were the party that presided over the 2008 crisis and its aftermath. They're the ones who, you know, who, who were in charge of the jobless recovery from that. Uh, and so for millions of workers, that's what the Democrats Democratic Party represents, and they've seen right through the, their, uh, you know, false worker-friendly image. Um, so, yeah, these are the real material factors that have created that deep-seated discontent, extreme polarization and resentment towards the status quo, uh, against the political establishment, uh, against the ruling institutions of, of, of the bourgeois state as a whole, and not just social media content and not just Donald Trump in isolation. Now, I think that we could ask the question, what does all of this, uh, what do declining living standards, poverty, homelessness have to do with abortion or whether trans people are allowed to compete in, in sports? And the answer to that, I think, is obvious. It has absolutely nothing to do. And these are used as scapegoats uh, by the demagogic right wing that's taking advantage of the situation and they're appealing to, in a very, very distorted reactionary way, to those who are fed up with the status quo and they're fomenting prejudice, they're fomenting uh, bigotry to shore up their base of support. And the reason that they get away with it is precisely because there isn't a bold leadership from the left, there is no class independent alternative to the Republicans or the Democrats. Now, I, this is nothing new, this uh, scapegoating and, and divide and conquer from the ruling class. This has been used throughout uh, the history, certainly throughout the history of capitalism and before, but especially in the US as a means to mobilize voters, to, to divide and conquer, to pit different layers of the population against each other. Uh, and I would say even this question of, of abortion rights and using issues of, of gay rights, sexuality, et cetera, even that is new, you know, uh, propping that up for political purposes. Uh, this, this comes from, you know, goes back to the 60s and 70s and 80s um, after the uh, civil rights movement, you know, after, after the uh, openly racist, segregationist base in the, uh, in the South, in the Jim Crow South, could no longer be mobilized openly around those questions. There was a search for another way to mobilize uh, the, the, the voter base. And so the, the white evangelical uh, voting bloc went from pretty much being non-existent in the 1960s as a, as a political force to becoming the single most important interest group of any Republican candidate in the 1980s. And again, this was developed consciously and fomented by a section of the ruling class and its representatives around issues of abortion, LGBT rights, et cetera. So in that sense, Trumpism, uh, in a general sense, is not really a new phenomenon as such. The weaponization of, of cultural identity uh, issues to divide and rule, the, the xenophobia, the racism, the scapegoating of immigrants and, and other, uh, and other uh, vulnerable sections of the population. But now, in the context of the worst decline in living standards in 200 years, it has intensified. It's, it's become much more polarized uh, than before. And the most degenerate layer of the ruling class, I would definitely include uh, Trump uh, in that, uh, are willing to exploit the worst instinct of the most backwards layers of the population, the most reactionary uh, layers of, the, of society to further their own narrow interests without any regard for how this is going to affect the legitimacy of, of the state itself, the credibility of the institutions of bourgeois rule. So things like the racist trope, classic, that immigrants come into this country and they take our jobs, it gets taken to like ridiculous extremes, like blaming immigrants for the baby formula shortage. And this wasn't just said by one or two people. Republican politicians were tweeting this in state after state, and you could hear it in soup. You walk into a supermarket somewhere in rural America, you would hear this from the workers at the supermarket. Now imagine, if there was a working class party that said that the reason that there is a shortage of formula is because of the inefficiency and irrationality of capitalist production. It's because baby food is produced by a small handful of monopolies that are owned by billionaires who don't care about your health, they don't care about your well-being, they don't care about your children, they do it for profit to profit themselves. And so if those monopolies can't guarantee affordable access to good quality food, they should instead be run under democratic workers' control based on a rational democratic plan of production to fulfill, driven by you know, the need to fulfill human need rather than profits. I think that with that kind of talk, if that were put forward by a mass 
uh, party, by, uh, by the labor unions, anything, it would be able to at least partially cut across this uh, reactionary uh, demagogy. But what did the Democrats have to say instead in response? Biden met with retailers and manufacturers to discuss ways that we can all work together to do more to help families access infant formula. So the companies that are literally poisoning your children are going to all get along and work together and we'll figure it out. The great liberal politician Pete Buttigieg said that, <laughs> let's be very clear, this is a capitalist country. The government does not make baby formula, nor should it. So I think that's crystal clear. The Democrats are impotent because just like the Republicans, they represent the interests of private property and capitalism. And even though the Republicans are the more rabid wing, right, the, 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 the vicious right wing in this culture war, the Democrats are also part of it. They're, they're also playing this game. Both parties use this, these issues in a very cynical way. In fact, I think this is pretty ironic that most of the Republican Party, prior to the Reagan years, they actually tended to be more pro-choice uh, because they were kind of like libertarian uh, about, about rights and stuff that the government shouldn't regulate uh, private citizens. Uh, but later on, he actually uh, became one of the most uh, vocal proponents of the anti-abortion rights uh, movement uh, in, in the uh, 80s, to again, to rile up that, that voter base that I talked about earlier. Trump himself uh, was a Democrat. He has given more money to the Democrats than he has in, for, to the Republicans. In 1999, he said that he's very pro-choice, uh, and then he became, of course, uh, you know, in 2016, he flip-flopped totally and he said that he's totally pro-life uh, and that women who, who uh, you know, choose to have an abortion should face punishment. Um, now, if we move to the other side of the spectrum, Obama in, in 2012 campaigned saying that he would codify Roe uh, into, uh, into law as did Biden. How did that pan out? Of course, didn't, didn't quite happen, did it? Not only did it not happen, uh, but he also made an executive order in favor of the Hyde Amendment to ensure that federal funds couldn't be used to provide abortions under Obamacare. And for his part, Joe Biden, uh, after the Roe v. Wade uh, ruling was passed in uh, 19, or, or was announced in 1973, he said that the justices are going too far, that a woman shouldn't have the sole right to say what should happen to her body, and his voting record is abysmal on the question of abortion. Uh, he has, uh, you know, he voted in favor of the Hyde Amendment. He voted in favor of the Hatch Amendment, which was an attempt to pretty much to overturn Roe v. Wade. He has five no votes to allow federal funding for uh, funding for federal employees' abortions. As recently as 2003, he backed an abortion ban that included no exception for the health of the mother, and he even has an anti-choice amendment named after him, the Biden Amendment. So. Of course, uh, if you read the New York Times or whatever, they're going to tell you that he's evolved with the times and that he's had a change of heart and he sees things differently now. Uh, but I think it's totally clear uh, that that's not the case, that the politicians and both parties are using these issues cynically and they flip-flop uh, just to rile up their voter, their voter base as, as election year fodder. Uh, of course, the Democrats like to present themselves uh, as the party of social equality, that they're advocating for mar marginalized groups. Uh, but actually, much of their response to this culture war has been to shift further to the right, to appeal to some of the more reactionary voters that are trying to win back from the, re uh, from the Republican Party. And so, for instance, uh, in order to try to, uh, yeah, to, try to um, yeah, again, get, regain some of this right-wing voter base, uh, they dropped... Uh, talk of, of defending trans rights uh, a lot recently. And when Hillary Clinton was asked about this issue, she said that the most important thing is to win the next election. Whatever does not help you win shouldn't be a priority. So we don't care about trans rights if it's not, if it's not gonna you know, pander to the voter base that we're trying to target in the next election. Of course, during the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, they made all kinds of fake promises to get people off the streets, and now they've become the party of law and order, and everywhere where they control cities and city councils, they've actually increased police budgets uh, to like you know, tame crime and, and, and all that kind of uh, bullshit. So, there's all kinds of other examples that I could cite, you know, Democrats that backed anti-abortion legislation in 2016, uh, others that backed anti-trans bills last year. Nancy Pelosi backed a right-wing candidate this year uh, for the Texas primaries who's anti-abortion and anti-immigration, and he said he's a valued member of our caucus. So again, these are two sides of a reactionary so-called culture war, which are manufactured, it's a, it's a manufactured 
war uh, that's used politically to rile up different sections of the population, divide and conquer the working class, and it's ultimately the fallout of the collapse of liberalism after years of inequality. The liberals didn't care about winning rights. It was achieved through struggle in the streets, mass struggle, class struggle, at a time when capitalism could actually provide some dignity, some, some basic living standards for many people. But now capitalism is in crisis, and when the liberals themselves have been in power, uh, of course, they've implemented anti-worker policies, but while, while they did that, they also used all kinds of woke language, uh, they preached liberal values, they preached political correctness, all kinds of tokenism. So for a lot of workers, not only do they have a reaction against the status quo and against the Democrats, uh, but also that the tokenism and those liberal values and the political, all that kind of stuff uh, is that all the empty phraseology, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of workers have a negative view towards. So. When the Democrats, you know, like when Nancy Pelosi kneels down, right, during Black Lives Matter wearing a Kenty cloth to, to do her, her posturing, that kind of tokenism empowers the right wing of the culture war because it makes them look like some kind of radical alternative to that phraseology. Like uh, DeSantis recently in, in Florida, he said that we're not going to let this state, the state of Florida, descend into some kind of woke dumpster fire, but the Democrats are a dumpster fire. Uh, and, you know, I think millions of people are agreeing with the Marxists. This wasn't always the case. 20 years ago, this wasn't the case, but millions of people now agree uh, that the Democrats are worthless. In fact, there's a survey that shows that 40% of adults across the country don't trust either the Democrats or the Republicans to handle the abortion issue. And so I think that leads to the question, then what do we do? You know, how can we uh, you know, how can we regain some of the, the rights that, that we have lost and, and fight for uh, improvements? How do we fight oppression? Again, just to be clear, concessions were won as a byproduct of mass struggle. It was never a matter of uh, voting for the lesser evil, uh, of waiting for the next election, begging politicians to pass legislation. If anything, I think the repeal of Roe v. Wade and some of these other legislations that are being passed should reveal the bankruptcy of all institutions of American bourgeois democracy, which is a system that is fundamentally undemocratic, as comrades pointed out yesterday. Uh, most Americans, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, said that they didn't want the Supreme Court to uh, overturn Roe. According to some polls, eight in 10 Americans back non-discrimination protections against uh, uh, for LGBT people, including 65 percent of Republicans. And so why should nine unelected unaccountable judges grant or take away fundamental democratic rights of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people against the will of the majority? Why should our rights depend on the interpretation and the reinterpretation of the Constitution, which is a document uh, that was uh, passed a couple, hundred, a couple hundred years ago, uh, drafted and voted on by a small minority of white male property owners in a compromise uh, to appease the, the, slav the slaveholders, right? So in fact, I think what we should point out is that the real legacy of American bourgeois institutions uh, on the basis of the Constitution and its interpretation, the Supreme Court spent more time legally defending slavery and sanctioning uh, segregation, legal segregation and, and racism than, than not in, in, all, in all its history. 150 years ago, the, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that black people weren't citizens and they could never be considered citizens under the constitution and therefore that slavery couldn't be banned from the U.S. territories. In 1896, uh, the Supreme Court said that equal but separate accommodations didn't violate the 14th Amendment and therefore that racial segregation is constitutional and this paved the way for the horrors of, of uh, Jim Crow for, for decades later. So when Biden says things like, oh, this is so bad, horrible, this is not normal, this is not what America stands for, these aren't American values, what is it? Racism? Sexism? Violence? Polarization? All of this, you know, absolutely. The U.S. is a country that's built on a bloody legacy of slavery and the genocide of the American Indian population with exploitation, racism, sexism, oppression built into its DNA. So again, the latest moves from the Supreme Court and from the capitalist politicians, more than anything, they're lifting the facade and reveal, revealing the illegit illegitimacy of the whole framework of uh, American bourgeois democracy. And so when we say that oppression is systemic, we should be clear that system today is capitalism. Uh, and it's a system that's based on the defense of private property, 
private ownership of the means of production and the exploitation of the majority by a minority of ultra rich capitalists. And so oppression, uh, repressive institution, all of that hasn't existed forever. They're not natural to humanity, right? That's what they w want you to believe that, uh, you know, uh, the police, the military, the courts, the laws, prisons, the presidency, the legislature, all of that, that they're natural, eternal, neutral, necessary institution. That's not true. These are all tools that are used by the ruling class to keep the vast majority of the population in check. And as we've seen, it's not just through uh, economic exploitation. It's not just through uh, full-on repression, but they also rely on the special oppression of different layers of the population and on propping up ideological tools that help them to maintain their rule. And so as socialists, clearly, we must have no trust in the Democrats or the Republicans, no trust in any of the institutions of the capitalist state, and we want to turn the issue on its head. We need to expose both parties for what they are while patiently explaining that at the root of the problem, at the root of all the suffering, the senselessness, the polarization in society is a class war. Uh, and so uh, we raise the need in the struggle against oppression to fight with class struggle methods. These are the only methods that will result in even uh, short-term reforms and improvements within the limits of capitalism through the coordinated mobilization of the organized working class. Why? Because the working class, all workers, we're the ones who produce everything in society. The working class controls the levers of society and therefore can shut down production and force the hand of the, of the capitalists by actually paralyzing their source of profits. That's actually the only real way that you're going to win concessions uh, in the struggle. And so there is no excuse, really, why in the face of all these disgusting attacks that are happening uh, in the midst of a revival of the labor movement, all the major unions aren't uh, you know, trying to take a lead on this, that they're, that they're not trying to build broad solidarity among all workers, calling to the streets. For example, they could be calling for a general strike to defend the rights and dignity of all workers, you know, uh, to, to defend abortion rights, but also to fight for higher wages, for union rights, etc. And you know, I think, um, it, you know, as Marxists, we don't think that the working class is this monolith. We understand that that it's, you know, it's, it's a very complex, especially in the U.S., it's a very diverse, a complicated, contradictory uh, layer in society. Uh, and therefore, we can't deny that absolutely uh, there are many workers who are backward, who are racist, who have sexist prejudices, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the point is that the cultural framing of, the, of this whole thing takes that as the starting point accentuates it and drives it deeper and deeper and deeper uh, to, to uh, make those prejudices stronger and drive it to a fever pitch. And now in the, uh, in the media, uh, in the uh, universities, among most of the left, pretty much the only ideas that are, that are available that are being presented as an alternative against to, to help fight uh, sexism, racism, and oppression are ideas like identity politics, uh, intersectionality, and other you know, similar postmodernist trends. And the, the problem is that like the so-called culture war, all these ideologies, their starting point is from the identity of, of groups uh, and, and or of individual identity, and identity. That's the starting point of the analysis. And so, it frames society and, and oppression as a subjective experience of each individual or group of individuals within a web of intersecting oppressions. And so each individual is an oppressor and an oppressed at the same time and, and therefore focuses on the individual as the primary perpetrator of that oppression. Uh, so these ideas emphasize precisely what divides the workers, uh, placing them within uh, different categories of identity or even individual identity, and therefore atomizes the, the movement and it leaves every group or even every individual to fight for their own rights separate from, from the rest or even sometimes opposed to uh, other groups in contradiction to other groups uh, and their rights. So this uh, only plays into the hands of the ruling class. It foments precisely those same divisions that they themselves lean on and that they're trying to prop up uh, to, to disarm the movement. And so. I would say that that's probably especially the case with uh, with concepts like privileged politics, which is this idea that, um, you know, it, it, for instance, it would tell white people or men or cis people that they need to look inside themselves and find their internal 
white privilege, male privilege, cis privilege as the source of, of racism uh, and oppression. And obviously, first of all, this cuts across uh, the potential for class consciousness because it presents all white people or all male people or all cis people, regardless of class, as the dominant group uh, on top of a hierarchy of individuals who are oppressors and oppressed. But also this only feeds the right wing. Let's take an example. Yesterday, we talked about um, the deaths of despair. A couple of comrades talked about it. Um, in a, a, you know, objector districts are those districts where basically the majority of, of voters and their representatives think that uh, Trump is a legitimate president and that Biden uh, didn't win the election. Uh, the median income of those districts is $36,000 a year. And that compares to $71,000 for Democratic districts and $64,000 a year for non-defector Republican districts. The mortality rates in those districts are much higher, and they have a much higher rate of rates of despair, uh, suicide, drug overdose, alcohol-related liver failure. And they haven't just been exploited. A lot of these are, as we know, also in the Rust Belt areas. Uh, and, and so they've, they're used to being exploited at first by the mining and coal industry that then left them out to dry, but also by the pharmaceutical companies that, that went in and, and, and like consciously targeted these populations to make them addicted to op opioids and then uh, leading to, you know, to, a, to a pandemic, an epidemic of opioid-related deaths. So they're privileged because they're white, because they're you know, male, because they're cis. And you can see how if you tell that to those poor working class uh, you know, workers, it plays into the right wing that takes that, packages it, and, and throws it back at them, using it precisely to twist it into racist sentiments, to intensify the bigotry. A lot of these districts are also districts that where you know, they used to be white majority, and now there's a lot more diversity, and so they're, they're feeling you know, threatened that the, the white majority is no longer, uh, is no longer the, the, the case. All of, the, all of that is propped up by the right wing because precisely of, the, of how uh, identity politics, intersectionality, and this question of privilege uh, is, is kind of the only alternative uh, that, that is presented in the fight against oppression in, in the mainstream sort of uh, left circles, universities, etc. I think what's key to understand in all of this is that no layer of the working class has any material interest in maintaining the oppression of any other layer. Uh, for example, we can definitely say that the white ruling class and some layers of the white petty bourgeoisie, they reap material benefits by, from racism uh, because they exploit workers and they exploit black workers more by paying them lower wages. So they're, and plus they use it to, again, foment division among, amongst the workers. But while some white workers may think that they benefit from racism, on balance they don't. You know, even when they're getting better jobs, they are getting higher wages than black workers, uh, or, or male uh, workers are getting higher wages than women, etc. It's the boss that's exploiting both of them, and that's super exploiting and paying less wages to the other layer. And overall, wages and conditions are driven down across the board due to this uh, poison. And so. Also, you know, as, we, as I said, this stokes divisions amongst the workers that's consciously fomented. And so working class unity in struggle would serve to raise wages across the board for all workers, raise benefits, improve working conditions, instead of what we have now, where different sections of the working class are pitted against each other uh, to fight over the scraps uh, that the capitalists are, are, are giving them. So we firmly hold that the working class can be uh, united around a common program of class demands. But does that mean ignoring oppression? The answer is absolutely not. The fight against oppression is an intrinsic part of the fight against capitalism, precisely because the socialist revolution can't succeed unless the workers unite. And so it's essential that workers understand that it's a capitalist system that is to blame for unemployment and cuts, that it's not the immigrants' fault, it's not the fault of, of all, all these other groups. They need to understand that, that, that they need to struggle together against the oppression that millions face if they want to fight for their own liberation. And so we must draw out precisely the issues that we have in common, that we're all exploited and oppressed to varying degrees by the system. And so the working class movement needs to go back to the age old slogan of an injury to one is an injury to all. In fact, the starkest effects of uh, oppression are rooted in capitalist property relations. Let's look at the question of abortion. First of all, obviously, uh, uh, you know, rich women, bourgeois women, they can, they're always going to have access to safe abortions because they can pay for them, they can travel, et cetera. That's not the case for poor and working class people. But also statistics show that the number one reason why people undergo abor abortion procedures is financial. 
And that's something that you don't hear that much from liberals or you know, that, that's, that's ignored by the way that the culture war and identity uh, frames this. Half of women who get an abortion live below the poverty line. And this was disproportionately, of course, uh, black, Latino, and other oppressed layers of the population. For example, in Mississippi, 74% of all women who received an abortion in 2019 were black, even though black women make up just 42% of the childbearing population in that state. And we know why this is. It's uh, almost impossible to raise a child in this country. Uh, giving birth, uh, it costs tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and then after that, what? Of course, the, the pro-life uh, people, they care about the embryo, but they don't care about, you know, the life uh, outcome of the, of the individual that's born. Um, it, the average cost of childcare is almost $15,000 a year. This actually, this, this, uh, this might be pre-inflation figures, so I don't know what it's, uh, what it's up to now. Some 13 million children in America don't get enough food to eat. Um, so attacks against the right to choose against abortion rights don't just harm people with uteruses, it harms ho the whole of society and the whole of the working class. If we look at the question of LGBTQ issues, 30% of LGBT youth experienced food insecurity in the past month, including half of all native and indigenous uh, LGBTQ youth. 22% of LGBT people in the US live in poverty compared to 16% of cis and, and straight people. And that shoots up to 29% for, for women and 31% for black LGBTQ people living in poverty. If we look at the question of, of racism and how it's persisted into the 21st century, now of course, thanks to the powerful civil rights movement, segregationist laws were abolished. So the legal forms of, of racism and racist inequality are mostly, not 100%, not but mostly gone. But the social, the material, the economic component of that inequality, the question of property, hasn't been resolved and was never uprooted. So systemic racism is still hardwired into capitalism to this day. For example, ending the racist uh, housing and banking laws didn't provide people with houses or with savings, right? Uh, the gap in home ownership has remained unchanged since 19, 1960. The wage differential between black workers and their white counterparts has actually grown since 2010, uh, sorry, since 2002 in the last 20 years, from 10% to 15% difference. The gap in uh, average savings between black and white families has also remained pretty much unchanged with black families having only a quarter of the savings. Uh, studies have found that segregation is actually worst now uh, than it was uh, 30 years ago. 80%, more than 80% of the large metro areas are more segregated now than they were in 2010. Uh, um, sorry, they're more segregated now than they were in, in the 1990s. And, that, and especially some of the most segregated cities and metro areas are Chicago, Detroit, and New York, Northern New Jersey, and Philly. And these are consistently, of course, the poorest neighborhoods, the most neglected, the ones that lack access to quality housing, to uh, quality schools, to employment, etc. And just as another example, 70% of black people live in counties with really high levels of pollution that exceed federal standards, which of course leads to horrible health consequences for the population. This could even connect to things like the question of, of gun violence, uh, which, you know, of course there's, there's, there's mass shootings and things like that. Some of them are are, are motivated by racism, by the way, as we saw in the uh, Buffalo shooting. But actually, the vast majority of, of, of gun-related deaths and, and shootings and gun violence, it's, it's crime-related. And so it's related precisely to the conditions of extreme poverty, poor quality of life, et cetera. So even in this so-called culture war debate over, over gun, uh, the, the right to bear weapons, uh, and, uh, and things like, like police and the role that they should play or shouldn't play in society, there is a class angle, and that's a people would not need to resort to crime if they were provided with housing, uh, with food, with education, with a job, et cetera. Now the list could go on. These are just some examples. And I think with every single issue in the culture war, you, you can reframe it. Uh, and that's what we need to do, right? We don't need to take the debate as it's presented in the media, as it's presented from the capitalist politicians. We need to turn the tables on the whole issue and frame it, uh, drawing out the Marxist revolutionary class angles. And so I think this, uh, some of the, the things that I, that I stated earlier, I think this bring, brings back words uh, like the ones that Martin Luther King said when he said that you can't talk about solving the economic problems of black people without talking about billions of dollars. You can't talk about ending the slums without first saying that profit must be taken out of the, out of the slums. And so the demands that Marxists raise in the fight against oppression are class demands. We fight not just for 
full reproductive rights, up to and including abortion, gender affirming care, all of that, but also for universal access to those services, free at the point of service as part of a national socialized healthcare system available to all. For parental leave with full pay for up to two years after birth or adoption, but also demands for affordable housing uh, with rent capped at 10% of income for a minimum wage of $1,000 a week with wages tied to inflation and a shorter working week of, of 20 hours or less, guaranteed free education education, free, full-time, high-quality childcare and after-schools program, affordable public laundry services and subsidized quality food, etc. Those are the kinds of improvements that would actually provide the material foundations for the liberation of women, black people, LGBT people, etc., and the entire working class. And these are socialist demands. They're, all of those I just listed, they're demands that we print out in the back of our magazine right here in our program. And so, you know, they, they are also not just demands that would provide the material basis to end oppression, they're also the kinds of demands that would help to rally the entirety or at least broad layers of the working class around a common program if there was a large force, a mass organization, a class independent party that was putting them forward. And that's precisely the key question. Labor must break with the Democrats, must break with the Republicans, expose them as anti-worker parties, and instead fight to build an independent mass working class party with a socialist uh, program. And I think that what's, what's really tragic about this whole thing, another, uh, another common culture war issue is the question of Marxism cultural Marxism and socialism as it's framed by the right wing. And uh, the, unfortunately though, there isn't a Marxist force that we are not in the media answering their arguments. And so that cultural Marxism or whatever is equated with the Democrats, with liberalism, with identity politics. Um, and, 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 it, and I would also add that insofar as there are any self-identified uh, socialists, uh, socialists in Congress, they're just providing left cover for the Democrats. And meanwhile, as we discussed yesterday at length, socialism, communism, you know, the need to uh, nationalize the economy, these concepts are more popular than they've ever been, especially among young people, especially among some of the more oppressed layers of the population. And also unions are more popular than ever. They're the only institution that actually their popularity has increased a little bit, whereas the popularity of all other institutions has plummeted. And so if a lead were given, it would absolutely find an echo. And so I think a, a perspective like this, uh, of, of like bringing the masses out into the street, having a class fight against oppression, against capitalism, could have seemed a little bit more abstract maybe, 20 years ago or something like that. But as we've talked at length, it's this is now, it's an epoch of revolution and we're seeing revolutionary uprisings in country after country from Iran to Sri Lanka to Ecuador, but we don't have to go to other countries. We don't have to go, you know, far out into the future or, or, or way back in the past. The Black Lives Matter movement in the United States is a perfect example of a fight, not just that brought out millions of people into the street, but a fight precisely against racism, against rep the repression of the state, against the violence, the racist violence uh, of the police, and it faced brutal repression. Uh, and it, as we know, it included uh, huge support from the whole population. 60% uh, of, uh, of, uh, of white people supported the movement, and even 53% of Republicans supported the movement. So, you know, uh, you can see how there was majority support for the protests, even uh, among the Republican layers. Now, we cannot deny that that again, that the US working class is divided right now. It's a very, again, uh, culturally diverse uh, and complex class. And because there is no alternative, it's being divided uh, in, in the way that the political debate is framed. So it, uh, we're not saying that it's going to be easy, that we can just snap our fingers and we're going to, to unite the class, but it's precisely in the process of common struggle, and especially under the influence of mass forces and mass events like the Black Lives Matter movement, that workers can begin to realize our common interests and develop those bonds of solidarity. And we should point out that of all the people that came out into the streets, it was pretty much a perfect representation of the population in terms of the percentage of white people, black people, Latinos, et cetera, that came out. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was pretty much like perfectly representing the actual ratio, right, in, in, of the culturally diverse working class in this country. And so a mass working class party would link up 
all these fights, the fight for LGBT rights, the fight for women's rights, with the fight against police brutality, and all the broad social demands of the working class as part of a broader struggle against exploitation and oppression against capitalism, and it would also escalate that movement into a revolutionary struggle to establish a workers' government that could actually tackle society's problems head on, and in that way, establish the material foundations that would actually genuinely liberate humanity once and for all. Thank <laughs> you.